be working on your videos and uploading them. Um, reports seem to be in pretty good uh, shape. We have one or two people who haven't turned them in yet, so you know who you are. Please get those in. We don't want to keep hounding you for them. Um, and uh, that's about it. So I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Thanks, John. So I uh, was recently attending a WISE conference, and um, one of the keynote speakers was Professor Dieter Fox from the University of Washington. And it was a bit of a retrospective talk, and he was uh, describing his experience at a robotics competition in the early 1990s. And um, he expressed how excited he was to be at this conference because there were all of these famous people at the conference. And by famous people, he was referring to uh, researchers uh, that he highly respected who had written a lot of papers that, that he had, had read. And, um, and, and it brought a lot of excitement to be in the, the same room um, as, as those researchers. So you might not realize it yet, but um, I have the pleasure of introducing you to uh, what I think is a, a famous researcher. And I think as you continue in your development as, as robotics engineers or machine learning engineers, you, you'll probably come across Professor Nick Roy's name uh, quite a bit. So Professor Nick Roy uh, started his PhD research, or, or uh, did his PhD research at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, where he worked with uh, a, a few other very well-known uh, PIs developing, uh, working in, in a team to develop the Minerva robot, which was a, a very well-known robot that uh, sought to give tours inside of museum spaces. And it was uh, led to a lot of inter interesting research uh, in how to deal with moving a robot in a very complex dynamic environment. And perhaps Professor Roy's uh, uh, most well-known contributions, or at least one of the ones that I, I knew as, as, as uh, most, most well-known contributions, was the development of an approach called coastal navigation which coupled uh, both planning with localization so that you could plan a route through a space in order to improve your robot's knowledge of its position inside of the environment. But then I was also surprised to find out that that was not necessarily his most cited work, um, but um, Professor Roy also has a, a paper uh, in machine learning and uh, active machine learning um, as well that um, I, I had not been aware of until I, I looked up yesterday. So, um, I think there's uh, interesting content for um, all of the different classes uh, for, for BeaverWorks Summer Institute. So since graduating from CMU, uh, Nick started the very uh, uh, highly regarded robust robotics group here at MIT, uh, where Nick's group has been working on a number of interesting problems, uh, all of which are very relevant to the uh, classes and things that you're learning here at BeaverWorks Summer Institute. Uh, for example, the, the control and planning for uh, micro unmanned aerial vehicles and finding out how to do planning and control for highly dynamic vehicles. So uh, that's relevant certainly for uh, the race car class where we want to be highly dynamic as, as well as the UAV class, which is a, a micro UAV moving through the environment. And then also the group is looking at how we understand natural language as well as uh, semantic information about the environment in order to better support uh, human robot coordination. So all very interesting topics. The last thing I'll, I'll say about uh, Professor Roy is that he is known for asking uh, really great questions at, at conferences, really great critical questions. So I, I know you all have been asking great questions as questions of speakers. So. Uh, I expect you'll uh, uh, have a number of interesting questions that you'll uh, propose to Professor Roy. So with that, I'll turn things over to Professor Nick Roy. Thanks for that introduction, Mike. Um, I didn't know I was known for asking great questions. People are usually known for asking obnoxious questions, not great questions. Um, so I invite you to ask either type throughout the, the talk today. Um, so I, what I plan to do is talk to you a little bit about sort of the, um, the technologies that you're using and developing in this class and kind of how we got here. And uh, then I'm going to talk uh, for a little while about some new ideas in my group that um, I think are probably going to look like they are most relevant to the race car group, but actually I think are more broadly general. And then what I'd like to do is just at the end of today, just spend a little bit of time talking about industry. And uh, the reason for that is robotics for a long time was largely an academic pursuit with 
obviously some large industrial scale robots, but they were very isolated from public view. And I think we've seen in the last uh, certainly five to 10 years, all of a sudden people are talking about robots in some positive and some negative ways. And I won't get into the policy implications, but what I will do is talk about sort of the state of technology, what the, the market implications might be, and what some of the open technical challenges are before we really see uh, ubiquitous robots. And like I say, please feel free to jump in anytime uh, with questions. Uh, my home department at MIT is aeronautics and astronautics, which is increasingly the home of robotics at, at MIT, although there's you know, obviously strong people in mechanical and, and ECS and other places. And uh, aeroastro people generally tend to love aircraft. And so um, I, I'm going to, you know, a lot of my research has been in developing the autonomy to make UAVs smart. And so what does that mean? Well, it's interesting to think back, you know, when I started MIT uh, 15 years ago, UAVs were just not something that people talked about. Nobody talked about drones. To the extent they talked about drones, they were either in the military or they were beekeepers. Um, and so if you were to type UAV as a term into Google, uh, and through the virtues of the Wayback Machine, you can kind of do this. Um, you would have got, or actually, no, this is not, this is a modern picture. You still would get pictures that look very much like this, right? This is largely, to the extent that people thought about unmanned aircraft, to the extent that any idea what that meant, they were large military assets designed to uh, be way high up in the sky, cameras, uh, certainly 15 years ago, they, they weren't uh, weaponized. They were just sensor platforms designed uh, generally for military applications. One thing that has changed in the last 15 years irrespective of what people think about drones, is the Google page itself has changed. And now, you know, in the last five years, you may not realize what an unusual thing this is, is that like, you know, web search engines did not have shopping links 15 years ago. And so you can click the shopping link and ask Google, well, if I want to buy a drone, which again, 15 years ago would have been a nonsensical question, um, if I want to buy a drone, what am I going to get? And you get a very different picture, right? And this is probably what you all now think of as drones or, or UAVs. It's like these little things that you order from Amazon or Hobby Lobby or, or, or Tower or wherever. And you all, you know, I would be surprised if less than half of you didn't have one of these at home uh, somewhere. And they're fun gadgets. They're basically flying cameras. And we've seen people do things like you know, film uh, you know, uh, national uh, parks. We've seen people film sports uh, events. Uh, we you now uh, drone racing is a thing, and, and, that, and that's pretty cool. This is a very, very big change in the, uh, what people think about this technology and what people are trying to do with this technology. So what's changed? Well, one thing that has changed is that uh, we have much weak, the uh, community, and certainly anybody wanting to build a drone or sell a drone, has access to low-cost, high-power microelectronics. So little bits of electronics that can do surprising things. Um, this is, these are now super, super cheap. Second thing that's changed is the availability of high power, high, uh, low cost, high power computation. So if you want a smart drone, you need a fairly beefy computer. Um, if you want any kind of autonomy, you need access to a large amount of computation. The amount of computation inside each of our, each of our heads is now less than the total amount of silicon computation that's on the surface of the Earth. But that is the thing that has changed in the last you know, uh, 10 years or so. 10 years ago, the amount of computation inside the human brain was substantially more than what the aggregate of all silicon computation was on the surface of the Earth. And the other thing that's changed, certainly for UAVs, maybe less for autonomous systems in general, is the, the uh, power density and energy density in batteries. And power density is not the same thing as energy density. I should fix this slide. Um, but power density is the thing that matters for UAVs in particular. What is kind of interesting to also reflect on is there's a pretty big market need that's driven all of these things. And it's not at all obvious, but what it is is these. So your cell phone has the ability to tell which way down is so that when you rotate it, the screen does the right thing. That's absolutely uh, enabled by high power microelectronics. Your phone has a remarkable computer inside here that's doing things, you know, very, very complex computation like Candy Crush and uh, Angry Birds. <laughs> I'm not kidding. These are actually, high, you know, it's, Angry Birds is a high complexity computation task that is enabled by this. If you were to play Angry Birds on a cell phone from 10 years ago, it would be a very, very different experience. Um, and then batteries. I mean, the biggest thing that sucks about these things is we're constantly plugging them in. And you know, there's lots of reasons uh, why we uh, have to plug them in as much as we do. 
but it is the case that there's an arms race between the complexity of computation we're doing on our cell phones and uh, the battery technology. And you know, all of that technology is really enabling unmanned aircraft and unmanned ground vehicles of the kind that you've been working with in this class. The thing that cell phones don't have, to a large extent, is the ability to actually understand what's going on around them. They do have cameras for a variety of technical reasons, such as being in your pocket. The cameras don't really give the cell phone much awareness of what's going on around. And that is crucial for any kind of unmanned system to be able to operate in the world, understand what's happening around it, make smart decisions, and not hit things. So these three technologies certainly have given us drones, for sure, but they haven't given us smart drones yet. Most of our drones are still fully equipped to fly at high speed into a tree without a moment's thought. They're fully ready to fly into the side of a building. They're fully ready to believe that uh, home is in Shenzhen, China, and uh, when they're sent home, they take off at high speed from your playground or park where you're filming a sports event, never to be seen again. So how are we gonna make these things smarter? Once again, technology change has enabled uh, smart drones. So the biggest thing that any unmanned vehicle really needs before it can be considered autonomous is the ability to understand where it is and what's around it. And I'm pretty sure that some of you have been working with these sensors, which are these laser rangefinders. And the Hokoyo Automation released this sensor in 2006. Prior to 2006, there were no smart drones, and there were no self-driving cars, and there were just barely um, uh, uh, service robots, indoor robots that could navigate. They, all of those service robots that could navigate and be reliable were driven by laser rangefinders like this, made by a company called Zik in Germany, but they're really heavy and power hungry and not suitable for a quad rotor. Zik was making safety lasers. Fukuyo Automation was also making safety lasers. As useful as these lasers are, they're not for us. They're meant to go on uh, uh, forklifts and uh, uh, mobile carts and other things in factories, such that if the forklift is, if somebody steps in the path of a forklift and the forklift driver can't see that person, the laser under the tines of the forklift will see that something's there and will apply the emergency brake. And the same thing is true of uh, mobile carts in factories, et cetera. So Hokoyo Automation and Zik Laser Rangefinder thought they were making these devices for factories, but in point of fact, what they were making were the first real sensor that robots could use to understand what was going on around them. I think you've all worked enough with the lasers to understand um, that uh, uh, what you're looking at here, um, in case you've forgotten, uh, the white space is the freeze uh, space. The blue stuff, is, the edge of the white and the blue is where an obstacle is. So clearly there's a wall here and a little wall here, probably more likely a column than anything. And what you get a sense of is the walls moving back and forth. And of course, we know the walls or columns aren't actually moving. The vehicle itself must be moving. And uh, you probably are, are used to the idea, if you can work with these, that there's a blind spot. Um, in the, in the field of view of the laser. Uh, of course, this is not a true plane of light, a cross section. What it is is it's a point uh, laser rangefinder uh, aimed at a mirror that's spinning really fast inside there. And so uh, this blind spot here is where the rotation of that spinning mirror uh, is occluded by the other electronics, and so it actually can't see behind it. Um, if you haven't been working with these on aerial vehicles, you might wonder what this pie-shaped wedge is right here. And what that is, is us dealing with uh, the um, fact that this is fundamentally a two-dimensional sensor. So the Hokoyu or any other laser rangefinder of this kind sends out a plane of infrared light that gives you a slice of the cross-section of the free space. Um, you can get a sense of how much you must have moved back and forth and left and right, and you can get a sense of how much you must have uh, uh, yawed. But if you're an aerial vehicle existing in three dimensions, then of course there's the altitude that you've got to worry about and, and roll and pitch. Roll and pitch, you can actually get from the IMU. So the IMU will tell you how much you must have rolled in this direction. And so the remaining degree of freedom is altitude, Z. We stick a mirror in the field of view of the laser right here and bend the laser light out of the, the plane at 90 degrees, and that gives us altitude. Um, this, uh, this is a useful idea, but actually has been superseded by now the advent of really low cost, lightweight point LIDARs. And so for our vehicles, we don't do this mirror trick anymore. We just buy a, like, you know, spend 15 bucks on a LIDAR light and point to the ground and, and you have altitude. So this, uh, as I said, Hokuyo Automation released the laser in 2006 and all of a sudden there was a sensor of the kind that had massively enabled 
ground vehicle navigation that was light enough and low power enough and physically small enough. Size, weight, and power, swap, are the things that we tend to care about in air vehicles that was capable of being put on a small drone. So uh, a couple of years later, we did this. And uh, here is one of the, the first videos of a uh, quadrotor drone. This uh, vehicle is made by Ascending Technologies. Unfortunately, you can no longer buy Aztec Pelicans because they got bought by Intel. And so the Intel drone-based light shows that you may have seen at uh, amusement parks or if you watch the Super Bowl in, um, I guess it was this year, the Lady Gaga mid, uh, halftime show, uh, there was an American flag lit up by drones or drones were colored to look like the American flag. That, uh, that drone show was built on the back of Aztec vehicles and this is one of the first Aztec vehicles. They actually custom designed it for uh, us, for, for my lab. And so it's really great to see that early investment in the research eventually paid off for these guys in terms of getting their company bought by Intel and now Intel is able to make pretty cool light shows. But you know, the light shows are really cool, but not nearly as cool as the fact that you can actually build maps with these things. So just by virtue of taking the cross-sectional area, cross-sectional footprint of the laser, estimating how much the vehicle must have moved from position to position, doing SLAM, which I believe some of you are implementing, um, we can get out these, these pretty good maps. Um, and this was a, a real success because nobody had ever been able to do this before on aerial vehicles. And there was a, a, you know, the, the, the real key enabler for us was sensors and computers on board. Uh, there were some algorithmic changes that we had to make. The vehicle is moving much faster now than ground vehicles do. And so we had to come up with new ways to align the scans uh, in a way that uh, was fast enough to allow stable control, et cetera. But it works pretty well, except in sort of three-dimensional uh, environments. So that last video is my lab, which is kind of a messy three-dimensional space. And so a fundamental 2D sensor doesn't really work particularly well for that kind of application. So we um, wanted a 3D sensor. 3D LiDARs do exist. They're very expensive. And in fact, you can't buy, uh, buy them right now. So you may know about the Velodyne um, spinning LiDAR, which is a thing that sits on top of almost every uh, self-driving car. You can't buy Velodyne uh, lasers right now. They're back ordered eight months because um, we don't know, but either Google or Apple or Nissan or one of the self-driving car companies bought all of them. So uh, it's a highly valuable technology. But it's not really appropriate for a drone. What is cool is that Microsoft thought they were making a gaming sensor in the Microsoft Kinect, but they, in point of fact, were actually making a sensor once again for all of us. So it's amazing how well these companies have done misunderstanding their business model, that really, you know, they're making sensors for us roboticists. The fact that there's a gaming application is, I suppose, fine. Um, but the, uh, th you know, this is an RGBD camera. It projects structured infrared light out into the scene, and it's able to recover uh, the structure of the environment. Once this came out, uh, we saw that uh, we could use these again, on aerial vehicles, strip off the extraneous packaging just for weight, and um, you can build now 3D models. And the underlying idea of how this works is basically the same as in the laser. Um, what you're looking for is an alignment from image to image, uh, from frame to frame. And so this is basically showing the result of aligning you know, pairs of images in time. And then you know, we can fly around and we can get out a, a 3D model. What you can see is the 3D model is not as, as good as the laser models that we were building. They're not as clean. There's a lot of noise in the uh, planes, et cetera. And that's just because the Kinect isn't as good a sensor. The LiDARs are super, uh, precision, super high precision, super high accuracy. And the other thing that you'll see if I let this play long enough is that it's missing chunks of the environment. And that's just because the decision-making system that was deciding which way to go wasn't thinking about how to make sure there was a complete mesh of, of the uh, thing. So. Um, Let's talk about what the challenges are. So, uh, you know, I've laid out very, you know, various capabilities that we have and that we would like. And, uh, you know, there's ba basically to make an unmanned system smart, and I think you've seen all, uh, a lot of this already, this uh, class this summer, is the vehicles have to know where they are. And that's largely signal processing and estimation theory. They have to know what's around them. Uh, still built on the top of signal processing estimation theory, they have to know what, they have to, know what to do next planning algorithms, and then they have to be able to uh, react to the unexpected and, and adapt and learn. And machine learning is starting to have an increasing impact on what, how, the technologies that the self-driving vehicles, both air and ground, are using to enable the answers to these questions. And then machine learning is also just enabling what we can do. Um, just uh, to sort of uh, give you a flavor of what is 
the limit of what we can do, I think, in terms of fast and aggressive and agile motion in the air. Um, I just want to quickly show uh, this video here, um, which is a, a video from my group that's a few years old now. And this, as far as we can tell, is still the, the most dynamic and aggressive flight in a GPS denied environment that's been uh, demonstrated so far. So the vehicle is using entirely onboard sensors um, to estimate its position and uh, uh, estimate its position in a known map. Full disclosure, this is not solving the slam problem. And then makes uh, smart uh, control decisions. So the vehicle is going 10 to 12 meters per second. One of the things that's complicated about aerial vehicles is that they have, uh, fixed wing vehicles in particular, is they have a stall speed. So unlike a ground vehicle or a quad rotor, you can't stop and think for a little bit. And the dynamics are also complicated uh, in the sense that if you want to turn in a particular direction, you typically have to roll. And so the field of view of the sensor is strongly coupled to the direction you want to go and the motion you want to follow. And so that creates challenges uh, for planning. So I'm going to talk uh, relatively briefly about just you know, how we do estimation in this particular uh, uh, domain. So I think that many of you in the course of doing localization and estimation have been working with um, uh, things like particle filters and common filters. And so I'm going to talk about how we actually do this in the air vehicle. The air vehicle is a challenge because we have this regular six degrees of freedom that we uh, care about, which is X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, yaw, when we're existing in three dimensions. But for, for a fast moving fixed wing, where uh, you have a stall speed, you really have to care about the derivatives of those things as well. So what I have up here is a 12 dimensional state space that we've got to do estimation in this case. And so, uh, like I say, I think you've seen some of these technologies. You've seen particle filtering and you've seen common filtering. So common filtering basically assumes a parametric form of the distribution that you're estimating for the position of the vehicle. And particle filtering assumes a non-parametric form. You draw samples, and you try and sort of you know, compute the likelihood of these different samples given the sensor data. And these are, these are, this tension is something that shows up in, in uh, developing unmanned systems all the time. Particle filtering I arrived on the scene in 1998, was the first Monte Carlo localization paper. And it really changed how people thought about localization because it's supernatural for the kinds of rain sensors. You don't have to worry about extracting features and, and, and doing complicated derivatives of those features. Common filtering is sort of the state of the art in aero systems. It's what uh, certainly has been taught in aero Astro at MIT for well over 50 years. And uh, for a lot of dynamic systems, it's really, really uh, intuitive. But it does, for incorporating sensor data like lasers and cameras, it requires you to start thinking about how you extract features from that data that allow you to do things like linearize the sensor, et cetera. And it makes some very restrictive assumptions about the kinds of environments, the kinds of sensors you can use. So that's the bad news on the common filter. The bad news on the particle filter is though as natural as it may be and as great as it was for ground robots, it's super painful for air vehicles because the complexity of the filter grows not linearly with the number of dimensions, but it grows exponentially with the number of dimensions, number of state variables you're tracking. So a ground relatively slow-moving ground vehicle where you're just estimating x and y and theta uh, with a laser, this is great. Uh, for a, a fast-moving laser uh, air vehicle where you don't have complicated sensors, but you just have IMUs and, and dynamic models, this is great. This is once you, start incorporate, once you want to st stick a laser rangefinder on an air vehicle and start running particle filtering, it's really, really slow. And so the question is, what do you do? So one of the things that uh, we, we uh, did in order to solve this is to observe that sensors contain different, different amounts of information about different variables. So for instance, remember that this is a Hokuyu laser rangefinder. It's a plane shooting light out into the environment. And the Hokoyu certainly lives in the full 12 dimensions of the, the air vehicle, but it can only see three of those, right? If the laser is essentially, we don't have the trick of bending the, the um, light out of the mirror um, because the, the thing is rolling and pitching and moving around so much as it is in the air vehicle. And so the challenge is, can we, uh, the thing is, is that if the laser is perfectly horizontal, all we can see is x and y and theta. That's the only thing that's observable to the sensor at that point in time. So filtering the full 12 degrees of freedom with a particle filter and a laser doesn't actually make any sense. So the question is, can we capture the information the laser actually sees and propagate it to the full state? And so uh, the answer is yes. If the laser is basically a measurement of some of the state variables, 
maybe you can particle filter on those state variables and turn that into an effective measurement that gets converted into the common filter. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the math of that, but this looks very much like a, um, a picture for that where we're particle filtering on some state variables, and you can see how the, the, the red dot shows the projection of the laser rangefinder into the environment from those particles. But it's a small number of state variables we're particle filtering, and then we common filter on the rest of it as an effective measurement. And we've got papers online that describe how to do this. But one of the challenges of autonomy is what is the information that the uh, uh, sensors are giving you, and how do you extract the most amount of information out of those sensors without paying an undue computational cost. And this is still very much an open question for autonomy, and some of you may be wrestling with this already, is that you want to do a thing, uh, one kind of algorithm with your sensors, but you can't afford it. And so how do you actually get the information out of the sensors in a way that allows you to do efficient computation? Lots more work to be done. Um, another uh, 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 challenge is uh, planning. So let's assume that I've, I'm, I'm a good state estimation person, and I worked really hard, and I figured out how to uh, get my laser rangefinder onto my flight vehicle, and I'm able to do estimation over all 12 uh, state variables while at the same time incorporating the laser data. How am I going to actually generate plans for this um, uh, vehicle with relatively complicated dynamics? And motion planning as a problem has been around uh, since the beginning of uh, robotics. It's, uh, it's both interesting and somewhat sad to note that when the first a so fully autonomous mobile robot was developed at Stanford in the 60s, the Stan uh, Stanford CART. Um, it had a monocular camera, it had uh, IMU, it had a computer on board, and it could navigate around the room uh, uh, relatively reliably. And we still don't really know how to solve that problem. We're still struggling with a lot of the same problems. The only thing that we can say is we can do it a lot faster than the Stanford CART could do it uh, back in the day. It would take the Stanford CART about 15 minutes to uh, process a camera image to estimate its position and estimate the geometry around it. We're a lot faster than 15 minutes now, obviously, but that's largely due to Moore's law, uh, more than you know, tremendous advances in exactly how we process the data. So some progress, but not at the rate that, that we would hope and not from the places that we'd hope. Um, so why is, uh, why, why is motion planning not a solved problem necessarily for this vehicle with complex dynamics? Um, if you've seen modern motion planning, you know that the way that a lot of autonomous systems plan trajectories for vehicles with complex dynamics is by random sampling. So the probabilistic roadmap or the rapidly exploring random tree, these are algorithms where you basically guess a random place the robot need to, might need to go in order to solve the motion planning problem and then see if you can get there. And you just repeat that over and over and over again. You just guess random samples. You throw away the ones that are going to be in collision or otherwise infeasible. You try and build a graph that you can search, and then, then off you go. And this is fine for relatively simple dynamic systems because building that graph is easy. But if you have complicated dynamics, such as like a robot arm that has many degrees of freedom, or such as a uh, fixed wing vehicle that can only execute certain kinds of trajectories because of stall and because of the way the, the, the inertia of the vehicle interacts with the wing, then you can't necessarily use a lot of these things. Is that basically when you uh, try and grow trajectories towards some goal state, it's really hard to actually know whether or not two states, two samples in your configuration space are actually connectable or not with these dynamics. So once again, we're faced with a tension between two different approaches. On the one hand, um, we could pretend that our flight vehicle is actually um, has really simple dynamics. This is actually how an awful lot of autonomous systems work, is that if you have a self-driving car, for instance, you generally solve for the center of the motion of the self-driving car, or more accurately, the center of the, the drive train axle. Um, excuse me, steering uh, axle. Uh, you solve for the center of that steering axle as an XY theta motion planning problem. You ignore all the complex dynamics of an Ackerman steered car, and then you rely on the controller to actually ensure that there's a feasible motion from one to the other. And that works kind of OK, and it certainly works, works well for self-driving cars, although if you want highly aggressive, highly dynamic car uh, motion planning, for instance, a rally driver or a NASCAR driver uh, or a Formula One driver, then that probably wouldn't work because you'd end up taking suboptimal lines through the race course. But for driving through Cambridge, it's basically fine. Um, but it is suboptimal. 
Uh, on the other hand, we could pl plan in the full dimensional uh, state space of the vehicle and uh, incur the full computational intractability and just take a really long time to actually solve those plans. And just as there was a middle ground for state estimation, there's a middle ground also for, um, uh, uh, for these vehicles as well. And that's basically we start by computing an initial plan in a low order system and then use that as the uh, um, starting point for the optimization that goes on here. And the basic idea is that if you have a pretty good idea of where good plans lie, that's a much easier optimization problem than starting from scratch with no idea of what a good plan looks like. And so uh, I'm not going to go into the mathematical details too much, but the short answer is, is that there's this concept of differential flatness, which you're welcome to uh, look up. Uh, there's lots of papers about differential flatness, which basically says that for certain kinds of dynamical systems, cars are one kind of dynamical system, fixed-wing aircraft and quad rotors are another kind of dynamical system, it is actually possible to plan in the, a, a, there's a low dimensional parameterization that you can plan in such that you will know what the rest of the states of the vehicle are going to do. And the, the reason it's called differentially flat is because you, you get, for a given trajectory of some set of state variables, such as the center of the body of the quad rotor, you will know what all the other state variables are plus their derivatives. And so differential flatness exists for, for many systems, like quad rotors, regular helicopters, et cetera. And basically what this does is it allows us to avoid the full penalty of planning in the high dimensional space until we need to do the last bit of optimization. So the way this works is that we plan for the differentially flat version of our vehicles. And we recover the full dimensional uh, representation of the uh, vehicle state along that trajectory. And then we finish with the final stage of optimization. And this, again, might be something that's useful to you. For those of you who are developing the race car, you could imagine planning in you know, some small number of dimensions of the race car and then doing a final step of optimization to get better uh, trajectories out. And this is exactly what we use for this quad order here. So this is a quad order flying relatively complicated and aggressive trajectory uh, in a very cluttered environment. Um, stay away from my lab late at night when we're doing these experiments. Because uh, it's always, you know, it's a surprise to have a quad rotor coming at you at 11 meters per second, but that, or 8 meters per second, excuse me. But that's what it's doing. Um, and this is a complicated trajectory because the vehicle has to know how fast it can go in order to stop at the end of the trajectory. So anybody can go 11 meters per second or 8 meters per second or how fast you want through my lab space. Not everybody can actually go through at that speed and stop when you get to the end of the, the wall. And so that's, that's the hard part here, is not going fast. The hard part is going just fast enough that you're, you're sure that you're going to stop at the end of it. Um, but there's one thing that's kind of unsatisfying, both about the, aircraft, the fixed wing in the parking garage video and this quad rotor video. I didn't really make a big deal of it, but it is unsatisfying that the planning that I've talked about and the estimation assumed that we had a known map. Boy, it sure would be nice for these, this kind of aggressive flight and this the aggressive, aggressive driving to work in unknown environments. The problem with unknown environments is that your laser can only see so far. And so you're really limited by what you can do with it when you decide to move into parts of the environment that are unknown. What do I mean by that? So, Let's imagine that you're, in this case, a, a little RC car of the kind that you've all been working with. And you wake up in the state of garage. And you've got a laser rangefinder uh, that can tell you the local environmental structure. And the laser rangefinder looks like this. Okay? So the robot knows that it's here. And it also is told that it's going to, going to try to get to that green square. And it's got to figure it out. So what does the robot do with the fact that it actually doesn't have a complete map? And all it's got is a partial map of free space. We got the white part, which is the free space. The red bits are the, the ends of the lasers where it know there must be an obstacle. And then the gray stuff is, it can't see it, doesn't know what to do. Conventionally, a robot would generally assume that anything it can't see is going to be occupied, because that's the worst case assumption. And so it would turn that into a map that looks like this. And that's a bit of a problem, because what's the robot supposed to do now? It, it's going to believe that the goal location, the green square, is unreachable because it's surrounded by obstacle. You know, if, you, if you're 
feeling good about this, then you can sort of do an ad hoc assumption as like, well, if I can't get to the goal, I guess my job should be to try and get to the, as close to the goal as possible and then hope that actually I'll get some in instance of, um, or some insight into what's actually there and, and maybe make better progress. But that's a very ad hoc assumption. It's not going to work an awful lot of the time. So the conventional conservative assumption is going to cause you to be overly conservative and fail on otherwise feasible missions. You could do the other thing which is assume that anything you can't see is free space. The world is a happy, friendly place full of butterflies. And we should, we know that we can't drive through the red stuff, but look, there's a tiny little gap right through the middle of that car. There's obviously a gap in that car. We should just drive through. You know, I'm being a little bit unfair in the sense that we get this picture up here, and so we can see that's a car, and I didn't give the camera image to the robot. Um, but even still, I suspect that even the most daring of us would be like, you know, I'm not, I, no. I'm just going to go around. Um, and in point, you know, if you look at what the actual structure of the space is, is you can see that not only would the optimistic assumption have led to a collision, but uh, a, a decent path was really not that far away. And, and the reason that we can look at this image here and say that this is probably bad, and we can also look at this image here and say, you know what? It's, it's, a, it's pretty unusual that all I could see is tiny little edges of things, and then all of a sudden there'd be these big long walls that just happen to be occluded. I bet you it's worth looking over here to see if there's a route. What are we doing there? We're using the fact that we've lived in the world for you know uh, a couple dozen, you know a, a few years at least, and the world has structure that we can leverage to say you know even though I don't actually know what's going on back here, I've seen these kinds of environments before. I know how they work. I bet that I can, I bet there's a reasonable strategy that's worth exploring rather than either giving up or barreling at high speed into something that I think might well be an obstacle. What we're doing is we're learning. We're using previous experience to inform what we should do. Yes, sir? Is there a way to sort of like blend these two assumptions by detecting types of environments? Like saying like, oh, this is a garage with yes. a lot of cars. So the short answer is absolutely. Um, hold that thought. If I don't answer that question in a satisfactory manner in 10 minutes, absolutely ask it again. But yes, you would absolutely like to, A, understand the structure of the environment, and B, understand the kind of environment that you're in, so that you can generalize or understand that you know, the, 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 um, a regular office building is, is not structured like an outdoor forest, and the status center is structured like no other building on Earth, and so your learned model will not generalize well. So. Uh, this basically takes us to the, the problem formulation, which is like, can I learn to do well in this? So I'm going to assume that what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm going to assume that I have my little RC car here. as a set of fixed trajectories it's, it's considering. I'm not going to optimize over all possible motions. Allow me to uh, just pick one of a library of things I might do. And then I'm going to try and choose the trajectory that has the uh, lowest expected cost. I'm going to pick one of my, I'm going to try and estimate the expected cost in terms of making progress towards the goal, being energy efficient, not having collisions. I'm going to assume energy, uh, collisions are high cost. And I'm going to uh, pick the one that has the uh, lowest expected cost. So if I had perfect knowledge, I could just compute the cost of each one of these trajectories and be done. Uh, if I don't have perfect knowledge, I can compute the likelihood that I will have collisions or not collisions. But that's a really hard thing to evaluate. I could use the, the, the fact that the maps are probabilistic to try and compute this probability over all the possible maps. But that's A, broken, because the maps are, the probability distribution imposed by a grid map of the kind that you may be working with is not a real probability distribution. It doesn't actually encode the true likelihood there's a cell there or not, um, which we can, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about later if you want to understand why that is. But the other problem is the set of possible maps is huge, and computing a real probability distribution over this is, is infeasible. So maybe what we can do is we can actually learn to predict from the partial map what is the probability of collision for each of these trajectories. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to learn to take features of the map and the environment and the trajectories, and I'm going to learn weights that allow me to predict the probability of collision for each one of these trajectories from data. So how's this going to work? Well, let's imagine that I'm training my car up. So I, I'm, I'm going to be the pilot for a little while, and I'm going to drive it around the environment. And at each point in time, the robot's going to be building a partial map. And uh, it's um, going to be uh, looking at all the possible trajectories it could be taking, even though I'm the one steering it. And it's going to label each one of these trajectories and the partial map it has at that time as to whether or not that trajectory in that map would lead to collision. 
And so the robot's here, and none of the trajectories are going to lead to collision in this map. The, the trajectories are all too short. I'm too far from the edge of, of free space. And I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going, and then all of a sudden, I encounter trajectories that are going to have collision. And I can either attach these labels by colliding with things or not colliding with things, or because I'm during a training phase, I can actually give the robot the entire map that, that you know, I collect afterwards and say, you know what, this is the map. Even though you're building partial maps and looking at, you know, sort of not understanding uh, what might be happening, I can label these here. I know this is actually going to be a collision because I have the full map, and I can label these. Because right? again, this is training time. And I've written this column here as trajectory x and map m. But trajectory map is a hard thing to learn from, so I'm going to extract features from these. And I'm going to, um, let's see, so I'm going to extract features that's, that basically compress the entire trajectory and the entire map into down just a few numbers that represent that situation or that scenario. So good hand-coded features might be like, well, how fast am I going? If I'm going slowly, I'm probably less likely to collide. If I'm going fast, I have more risk of collision. How close am I to the edge of unknown space? Far from the edge of unknown space, low probability. Far uh, close to unknown space, high probability. And so on and so forth. And the name of the game is going to be, can I take those features of like, how fast am I going? How close am I? Is the distance to the, is the nearest obstacle to my side? Or is it right in front of me? Am I driving high speed in the, in, uh, right at something? Or am I driving at high speed alongside something? And I'm going to give this to a learner that then learns to predict the probability of collision. And that learning process is going to be uh, not perfect, but it's going to give me reasonable uh, performance. So I can imagine, like, uh, I have feature values, feature one, feature two, and the, the, this particular learning function depends on a function k, which is basically picking those weights. The magic of the learning happens inside here. And I can predict for a particular value of phi one and phi two uh, whether or not I'm going to collide. And again, to your question about different environments, different features will have different impact on the likelihood of collision in different environments. So you can see that like office buildings, as long as, if, as, long as I'm on this side of the sort of the notional line that separates the red and the blue dots, I'm probably going to have low collision. And if I'm on this side of the, the, the notional line right there, I'm probably going to have high probability collision. Uh, in the freeway, it's much more separable. Not surprising. Freeway, probability collision is much easier to understand. And so I can make useful uh, predictions. Um, I do need to do a little bit of work in order to recognize when I'm in en environments that I've never seen before. So uh, I I'm not going to get into the mathematical details of this, but we have the ability to recognize when we're making predictions about scenarios for which we have no training data, in which case we back off to a, um, a safer uh, planning strategy that isn't, uh, that isn't just sort of blithely assuming that our predictions are reasonable when it's a kind of environment that we've never seen before. And so we put this on uh, RC car, and is it going to play? Uh, this particular video here shows uh, the vehicle, or it's about to show, the vehicle navigating at high speed in an environment where uh, it's using the laser. But rather than doing the thing that you're probably all used to, which is building a map and then solving for an optimal motion uh, plan through that map, what it's doing is it's taking the instantaneous laser rangefinder data that is just the cross-sectional area of the environment the uh, vehicle can see right now. And it's making a prediction about which is the fastest motion primitive it can follow that is, has low probability of collision. Um, that, that's not quite right. It's, it's picking the, the uh, tr uh, primitive and the, the motion primitive library that has the lowest expected cost. And um, the video plays. Here we go, the video's playing. What you'll see is the vehicle starts off going relatively slowly, goes fast down this corridor. It slows down. It's learned how to take this kind of chicane. So it knows sort of how to serve around those kinds of obstacles in the way that a Formula One racer would do. Opens up the throttle, the metaphorical throttle, electric vehicle here, as it goes into that big open space. And then it comes up to one of my favorite points of the video, which if you know Formula One racing, the hairpin turn under the casino in Monte Carlo looks very much like this. And you see Formula One racers go from 200, 250 kilometers per hour down to 20 kilometers per hour in that hairpin turn and then open up the throttle again um, as they get into the straightaway. Our vehicle knows how to do that exactly. And the thing that's really interesting is it's able to predict which are the kinds of turns where it can't see beyond, where it can go a little faster, and which are the ones that are really like hairpin turns and it's going to have to go slow. And that's the kind of thing that there just isn't enough information in the instantaneous sensor data 
uh, or even the history of the sensor data that allows it to make predictions into that unknown part of the map. It's never seen this environment before, at least it thinks it's never seen before. Um, and uh, the, what we're doing is we're filling in the missing gaps in the sensor data with what the vehicle has seen of these kinds of environments before and um, uh, filling in these kinds of environments before and, and using that to sort of make predictions about what is, what is going to work well and what is not going to work well. And we do this all the time. Like I'm not optimizing my trajectory as I go through, as I try and leave a, um, a building that I've never seen before, but I can use information about the environment. For instance, doors are good ways to leave um, uh, rooms. Exit signs are a good thing to follow as you actually want to get outside a building. We don't have that level of sophistication in the learning system yet, but we're working towards that. The other th the thing that's uh, a little bit sad about um, this video is we're still using the laser rangefinder. So even though the laser rangefinders have been great for autonomous vehicles of various kinds uh, because they're high precision, high reliability, high accuracy, they're also really expensive. You know, these lasers are $5,000. They're, they're uh, uh, expensive in size, weight, and power. It's, uh, this particular laser is 250 grams, and uh, it pulls at uh, 12 watts. No, it pulls 8 watts, but still not, uh, a lot. And it's relatively big. Whereas, again, yours and my uh, cell phone has a great sensor in terms of these really, really uh, large um, uh, uh, pixel uh, image plane cameras. And so wouldn't it be great if we could do all this stuff using uh, cameras? And the answer is, we're starting uh, to get there. So uh, in my lab, this is a video of us, um, an early result. Uh, no, that video won't play. All right, well, I have a better video in a second. So in my lab, we're starting to get image-based navigation to work. So with a monocular camera and an IMU, we can now, uh, without even doing SLAM, but just by image-to-image -image registration, we can go a kilometer at 20 meters per second, which is about, um, 40 miles an hour, and we'll have a position drift of about 1%. So we'll be wrong by about 10 meters at the end of that uh, one kilometer trajectory just using the single monocular uh, camera. And that's the result of um, a uh, DARPA program that's joint with uh, Draper Labs, which I'll talk a little bit more in one second. Um, the other thing, of course, we'd like to do is to get the learning algorithm to be able to take a single stationary uh, image and make good predictions about steering data as we go fast. And we have this working now on the RC car uh, in that we're able to do the same kind of video you saw a um, second ago, but without using the laser rangefinder. Uh, but we can do it with the camera. I didn't have a chance to include it. Um, and we also, as of last Thursday, have the ability to do this on quad rotors now. So we can do the same kind of motion prediction in um, uh, indoor environments uh, that allows the quad rotor to go really fast uh, without having to build a detailed map and without having to solve for the motion planning problem. Is there a question up at the back there? No. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, so for the uh, video, uh, or yeah, two videos ago, yep. um, when you're trying to do the path with the lowest probability of a collision, yep. so what if the robot uh, encounters a junction and uh, turning right has the least amount, uh, like the lowest probability of a collision, but you want it to turn left? Yep. Uh, how would you, how does it solve that problem? So that's a great question. There's, there's, the, a detail that I left out is that part of the expected cost calculation is how quickly are you making progress towards the goal. So if you get to that T-junction and you think the goal is off to the left, but the lowest probability uh, motion primitive is to turn right, the, the fact, so long as the motion to the left isn't really high probability of collision, then the fact that you're going to make progress towards the goal will probably bias you toward in that direction. That being said, there is actually a, a pretty big open question about how do you deal with dead ends and things like this. And the answer right now is that we don't have great ways of dealing with them. The way that we deal with dead ends in my lab when we're doing that aggressive driving, aggressive flight work, is that silently in the background we are building a globally consistent map. And when we hit a dead end, we label that, that part of the map as a dead end. And then we basically have to rebuild what it means, that the, the, the part of the expected cost function that says what it means to make progress towards the goal. That's really slow. I hate it. And so uh, I, one of my grad students, Greg Stein, has been you know, uh, charged with fixing that problem. The, the bottom line is you have to have some memory of what didn't work in order to make different choices the next time you get to that T-junction. And we don't quite know how to do that. Yes, sir. 
What are the most like efficient features you can look for from the monocular camera that won't slow down your computation so much that it's not real time? So in point of fact with the camera thing, we actually, uh, we use a technique called deep learning, which you probably encountered. And so the deep learner is picking the features for us. And what's really nice is that this is a relatively simple classification problem. So a lot of deep learning implementations require you to have relatively large networks that are expensive to compute. This particular problem, we, the, the, the actual, the training is slow as always, but the evaluation is relatively fast. We can do it on a single core of a ARM processor. Yes, sir. Uh, so given the fact that the robot, um, it doesn't have a full map of its environment, is there a way that you can program how much um, risk it's going to take in um, something that it might, it might not be um, what it predicts, but it will assume that it might be? You know? Can you give me an example? Uh, so if, the, um, if there's a, uh, a term that looks like, from what you, what, you, what you have, it looks like it would be you know, it would go very fast during it, down it but in reality, it's just deceiving. How, um, how much probability would it give to the fact that its assumption is correct and that it will not, like? Right, okay. So I think your question is basically, I think this is a good direction to go, and I think it's low probability collision, but there's something about the environment that makes me wonder whether or not that prediction is correct or not. Like, and, and so we know how to handle that, as long as, the way that you sort of get, so, so, so your spidey sense is like, this is a high risk thing. That spidey sense probably has to come from how familiar is this? Does this really look like a corridor you've been down before? Or is it different enough that your prediction might be wrong? And we use ways of classifying, is this, how novel is this? How unusual is this relative to our training data? If this looks exactly like something you've seen before, it's not at all clear where that risk might come from. Does that answer your question? Okay, great, yes sir. So I know you said that you have a cost function for uh, each path that you may take with yep. the latest scan data. Um, how do you come up with that cost function? Is it like by hand or is there one? Oh, uh, that's, that's a great question. The cost function has uh, not a lot of terms. So it uh, it's basically consists, consists of are you going to what's are you going to collide, um, which is a probability that uh, or what is the cost of collision. What is the cost of motion, and how much progress are you making towards the goal? So you could put other terms in there, but we don't care. So that, to, that, to the extent that it's hand designed, it's hand designed in that way. The probability of collision comes from the learner. The cost of collision is a free parameter we pick. And what we do is we actually do experiments where we vary the cost of collision, and we get different behavior out from the vehicle. So when it thinks that collisions are really expensive, it basically becomes a super conservative robot that doesn't want to go anywhere where it doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. When we um, uh, make the cost of collision really low, uh, then we get a Boston driver. Um, and then uh, in between, you get more, more realistic uh, behavior. Um, and then the last term is, the, are you making progress towards the goal? And uh, that is back to this question for this gentleman over here, which is, how much additional information do you want to give it so that it knows it's making progress towards a useful thing? Any other questions? All right. Um, so, how much time do I have, by the way? Uh, a couple of minutes. Couple minutes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I have more than a couple minutes worth of material. So, let me just tell you sort of like one thing that is working really well, which in this vision based navigation is the fact that we can do a lot of this with a single monocular camera. So, we do have this DARPA program called Fast Lightweight Autonomy, where the challenge is can you fly from a long way away, enter like a, a, a rubble uh, type environment, and, and do something useful in this uh, kind of space? And this is a, uh, so th this being a DARPA program, DARPA really likes to do sort of competition style challenges between different teams. And so uh, last fall, we went to an Air Force base in Florida, and uh, the particular challenge that we had to execute was, um, could we take off from this part of this road and be told that there was a, um, a uh, target, a barrel, which you'll see what I mean in a second, over here, given no information about the environment except for the, this particular overhead map. So this is just a Google uh, overhead image. It's a couple years out of date. Some of those trees are bigger than they were. Some of those trees are gone. The environment, you know, there's still that road is still there, but you don't have a detailed geometric map of the kind that could allow you to just solve a motion planning problem. 
And we wanted to do this. So the goal is to do this as quickly as possible. We're not able to go 20 meters per second yet. We are, in this kind of environment, however, able to do 10 meters per second. Um, I don't have that video here, but what I do have is a video of the quad rotor actually doing the, the mission here, which is it's made it, I've, I've cut it for, for length, but it made it down the road, uh, which is a pretty boring thing. It's looking for the entrance here. It's building models of the trees using vision-based SLAM. It's doing all of its position estimation with a single monocular camera. It thought it saw a route through the trees. That route turned out to not be there, so it went this way. And what you'll do is you'll see that camera find a trajectory and um, uh, find the barrel and then say, right, mission done, time to go home. And so what this does is it illustrates uh, the, um, the fact that Navigation is something that's worked really well for robots for a long time, and that kind of navigation has, is what's enabling things like the self-driving car industry. Uh, GPS denied navigation using laser rangefinders has worked really well. It's made it out to the lab into the self-driving cars. Um, Camera-based navigation is going to be the next thing, and what this video hopefully does is illustrates the fact that the um, camera-based navigation is starting to work well enough that you can actually do these kinds of missions on them. It's still in the lab. You can't buy any kind of commercial system that's doing autonomous navigation that's purely camera or camera and IMU based. But I would predict that in the next three to five years, it'll have matured enough and be commercializable that your drones that you buy will have this kind of uh, technology on it. Um, I, uh, if I really only have uh, a couple minutes, then I probably won't get through uh, all of this material. Uh, but I'll leave you with the fact that um, certainly in the drone space, the economics are starting to work out um, uh, really well. So we know that uh, the consumer market for drones is growing substantially. So these, uh, it's hard to get up-to-date figures for uh, the state of the art of the drone industry. Um, this is, of course, the incumbent player that many of you may recognize, uh, DJI. And uh, they, uh, in the space of uh, 11 years, um, in 2013, $131 million in revenue. In 2015, they were valued at a $10 billion company. And they're continuing to grow. So uh, for those of you who are thinking about uh, a, um, a, a career in aero-astro engineering in particular, it's not just about the military and space. The consumer market is growing at an exponential rate. The number of air vehicles are predicted to be in the air uh, is the unmanned vehicles is predicted to grow 30% year over year for the next 20 years. So that's from the, the technology side, is that there's real opportunities for, for companies uh, to start. Um, there's also the opportunity in terms of markets. So the two biggest markets uh, that are predicted for UAVs in particular are precision agriculture and civilian inspection. And uh, more precisely, civilian inspection and remote sensing is predicted to be a $12 billion market by 2019. Um, these two are the ones that sort of have the hardest numbers behind them. So that $12 billion is probably real. And precision agriculture is probably real in terms of $9 billion. Why is precision agriculture such a big deal? Let me just give you an anecdote. The US grows 30% of the world's cotton. Cotton is an extremely labor intensive um, uh, a, a crop to grow. And it's ridiculous that the US, which has some of the highest labor costs in the world, would be growing such a large amount of cotton. And the answer is, is because the US is able to uh, grow high precision uh, cotton. The cotton balls come off wh whatever they grow on with the same length, that there's, there, there aren't flaws in the plants, et cetera. And this is because of technologies like GPS for the harvesters, is because of very careful, precise placement of fertilizer, et cetera. And it's because of imaging from air vehicles. So, you know, the agriculture industry is investing heavily in the, these kinds of technologies for just understanding what's growing out in the field. Um, I spent a couple of years working at Google. I helped to uh, found Project Wing. Uh, most people have heard of Amazon's efforts in the space too, the Amazon Prime Air. This predicted to be about $4 billion uh, market by about 2018, which is next year. That's almost certainly um, a, uh, uh, the wrong, um, uh, figure. It's, uh, tw this is probably more like 2025 by now. And there's an awful lot of other markets that people have looked at that are potentially um, a, a target for the technologies you're developing here. So uh, you all should be excited about not just you know, the basic coolness of the technology you're developing, but also the, the economic potential that uh, could be realized here. Um, so I think with that, because it's a little after 1230, I'll stop and say thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions.
asked your questions already. Okay. So, and then, so, so you know, you can put three volunteers. Thank you guys.